Thanks, Tom. One thing that I would add um, to that discussion, it is really tough to get rural Pennsylvania landowners to deed you anything. So sometimes it's easier to get them to assign you something. The best ask is for a 5% interest that's conveyed by deed. The sticking point there may be that deed word. They may have trouble with that. They may want to give you money and be very charitable and generous, but they may not want to give you an interest in real property. And the good news is there's still a way to benefit, there's still a way to get that gift, and that's what Trent was saying. You can do that by assignment of the right to receive royalties. Rather than a royalty interest, which is a real property right, part of the old gas and mineral rights. We're kind of splitting legal hairs there, but it's important for the charities to understand, the nonprofits in the room to understand how to get that gift if you meet any resistance from someone who doesn't want to convey property right. The other thing that I would mention quickly too, uh, Betsy made a very good point. If you're getting, uh, if you're made an offer of a working interest, that's a red flag. And for those folks from the traditional shallow producing regions of Pennsylvania, I'm looking at folks from Warren and, and Bradford areas and uh, you know, Oil City and Titusville and other places, you quite possibly could have a small operator, a traditional vertical operator, who wants to give you a share of his company. Well, part of what he wants to give you is a working interest in not just maybe one well, but maybe nine or 10 or 12 wells. Can you accept that gift? I won't say yes, I won't say no. I, I will say you better be very careful because there are ways to structure the transaction where you can accept the gift, but whether or not it's prepackaged and capable of acceptance uh, is another question entirely, and the odds are pretty good that it's probably not, and it needs a little bit of work. So, so one of the things we wanted to do uh, is talk about this concept of mineral management. What the heck is that? It's a Western concept. Um, we're gonna introduce the concept here. We've not had a lot of mineral management universally or uniformly throughout Appalachia. It's probably the rule rather than the exception, especially for larger tracts that are held uh, in, in Texas, Oklahoma, and, and many of the Western producing states. But it's kind of a new concept here. Let me, let me, let me go back just one, Steve. Let's talk about why is, that, why is mineral management in quotes? When you see mineral management, um, that's kind of a, a red flag for us. Because in Pennsylvania, oil and gas are not minerals. You may have heard that a couple of times in earlier slides. But in, in most oil and gas producing states, they're talking about oil and gas as part of the mineral estate. In Pennsylvania, oil and gas are not minerals. Oil is not gas, is not coal, is not a mineral. Okay, they're all separate and distinct. So that's why when we talk about mineral management, uh, we're talking about a Western concept that has to be adapted for use in Appalachia. Uh, Steve, you want to talk about yeah, I'm Steve Frankhauser, and uh, we're going to have to skip around because I think our our slides are a little bit out of order. But here's the deal. These are huge assets, and heretofore they had generally been unrecognized. And now they are recognized, and they're recognized by world leaders. A couple of stats. Six of the uh, ten largest companies by revenue in the world are oil and gas companies. Nine of the top 20 largest companies by revenue in the world are oil and gas companies. As my colleagues say, you're in the big leagues now. So now you need to manage these assets, minerals in Ohio, or Ohio, where I was <coughs> raised, uh, or oil and gas in, in Pennsylvania. So uh, for nonprofits who are recipients of these assets, it's critical that you understand the basic rules of the game. He's just explained to you that uh, oil and gas are not mineral rights in Pennsylvania. That's one of the few states where this, frankly, exists. We talk about, if you, while we're, while we're there just for a moment, uh, when, is in, when is gas not gas? If it's in Pennsylvania and it's and it's coal. Coal bed methane is not treated as part of the gas estate in Pennsylvania. It's considered to be coal. Lots of reasons why we won't bore you with those here, but the bottom line is Pennsylvania is almost always the exception to the rule, whatever rule we're talking about of oil and gas law. 
Uh, there's the Texas rule and the Oklahoma rule, and then maybe in a footnote at the bottom of the page, if anybody bothers mentioning the Pennsylvania rule, it's going to be an exception. You know, we're one of only three oil and gas producing states to follow something called the apportionment rule. We can spend an hour on the apportionment rule. I won't do that to you, but let me just say that if you don't know that and don't understand that, or worse yet, the Houston-based energy company that's paying your donors royalties, or maybe the royalties on the property that you've received as a gift, if they're not following that right rule, you're not getting paid what you should be. Maybe your donor isn't being paid. The short answer, an acronym that, that I, I came up with, actually my, my former partner came up with when we were dealing with a lot of energy companies uh, years ago, TAT. This ain't Texas. And it's important to understand that. This is different here. What if they say yes? We heard that question earlier. It's entirely appropriate. That's what we're here about today. But, but first, what's the question? What are you asking for? We heard a little bit about what, you know, what the best asks are uh, from the previous panel. Are you looking for a one-time gift or a regular income stream? And how, you know, there is a certain rank to those in terms of the preference. Preferably, you'd like to see something that's permanent, irrevocable. Um, if it's a one-time gift, you don't have to make an ask again. If there's future production, you can get that as part of your ownership. That's that. That's that number one highest highest option. Uh, if you get a, if you're lucky enough to get to be working with a donor who's willing to give a property interest, that's great. But if not, if if they're reluctant to deed anything to you, there are still other options available. When are you going to ask? We heard earlier about when wells were drilled, rig counts. We saw maps with dots on them. What does that mean? That means there's been a flurry of activity in parts of Pennsylvania. That's already happened. Does that mean the opportunity's gone? No. That means the opportunity really, in many cases, is just starting. What do people, you know, what opportunities have passed? Maybe the opportunity to, to request a gift of some portion of a bonus payment. Maybe the opportunity to receive some portion of the oil, gas, and mineral rights under some property before their value went through the roof. Um, but certainly there are opportunities to receive future royalty payments and, or a share of future royalty payments. And if you look at the dots on the map, that's not opportunity lost. That's where those royalties are, gonna, are either flowing now or going to flow. Those are your areas of opportunity uh, in the short term. Long term, the areas of opportunity are the ones between the dots, where there has yet to be this, this activity and development. Okay, so let me add to that. This is a great time to acquire assets because they should be lower priced. And this is a great time to ask for those assets because the donor will at least theoretically perceive that they are not as valuable today as they were in 2011, for instance. So in, in my world, this is a great time to accumulate assets. But I wanna put up a, a warning sign for you. Never take anything for face value. Never take anybody's representation. I wanna give you my, my, my oil and gas interest. I've heard that many times. But what I really see is I want to donate this lease to you, for instance. And the recipient thinks they're getting the real property interest, but they're not. They're getting a contractual right. And you'll notice sometimes somebody says, I want to give you my oil and gas interest. You think you're getting the real estate interest, but no, what you're really getting is their part ownership of a, of a lease. And whether it's in production or not, and, and Bob talked about this a few minutes ago, the executive rights. There is this little uh, killer out there, and the killer is when you share contractual rights with two other people, for instance, or another person, and if you know oil and gas leases, like any contracts, they carry rights and responsibilities. How do you decide who gets to do what under a contract when there are requirements of a landowner. Frequently this comes up where siblings each own, for instance, a third of a lease. They come into our office for financial advice and I say, do you get along with your siblings? Well, I get along with one. So you have to go, to go through that vetting process at the onset to see if what is being represented to you is in fact correct. Are you getting the real property interest or are you getting a contractual right? And if you're getting a contractual right, contracts have duties and responsibilities and liabilities assigned to them. So that last bullet point, when are you asking or, or are you asking for a real property interest is critical to this component.
We have had many charities realize benefits of one-time gifts of cash. Cash is easy. We, we tend to see that people um, who maybe have already had a history of philanthropic giving maybe will make additional gifts of cash. Most rural Pennsylvanians, most rural Appalachians, when they get that bonus payment, they're paying off their debt, they're buying a couple of toys, and they're going on vacation. And that's it. And Dan Brockett made a good point earlier. We don't see a whole lot of lottery type uh, attitude there. Pretty conservative approach, but that's what happens. Most people don't perceive that they're able to be charitable at that point. What don't they do? They're not saving it. They're not investing it. There's some exceptions. There are a few, a few cases where they do, but mostly, you know, they're paying off debt, buying toys, and going on vacation. And they're not giving to charity yet. We go to the next slide, Steve, I think. Um, when do they start perceiving a charitable intent? When they first realize that they can afford it? Good news. New donors are more likely to, to feel charitable and to feel like they can afford to be charitable about the third royalty check that they receive. True story, working with uh, a customer in Washington County, a uh, mill worker probably earned $55,000, maybe $50,000 a year near the end of his working life. Obviously uncomfortable, had to confess that, you know, he bought a new truck, which was six years old. Um, obviously uncomfortable talking about some of these issues, getting financial advice for the first time. He wasn't, you know, he didn't need that. But it was so frustrated because at the end of, you know, our, our, our initial conversation, he reaches into his pocket, pulls out three uncashed royalty checks, each of which was larger than his annual income, and said, I just need to know what to do with these. And it's that moment when these folks then are very receptive to the ask. Okay, and so that's the good news. Bad news is, by the time you get to this point, they're getting that check every month, and if you don't have some way to automate your share that you've asked for, you have to depend on them to write a check every month. That's not a, that's not a great approach. You can, you can always just deal in cash and wait for the, them to convert their oil, gas, and mineral interests and royalty rights and all these fancy rights. You wait for them to be converted to cash, but then you're gonna be left with a monthly ask, which isn't, which isn't fun for any concern. There are some things that can be done to help automate that process. We talked about mineral management. Mineral management from a, from a uh, 30,000 uh, foot view involves the verification, the administration of that asset, that, that right to receive the royalty income or that fractional interest in the oil, gas, and mineral right. That may involve uh, having some input on leasing activity, but more often it has to do with verifying the accuracy of royalty payments that you're being paid according to what you're owed under the terms of the lease, under the terms of any division orders, under the terms of any declarations of pooling and unitization. But there are some things that can be done if you don't hit the home run and get the 5% or 10% fractional interest in the oil, gas, and mineral rights, where the company is going to separate your 5% and send it automatically every month under a division order. There's still ways that you can get that same result from the, from the donor an assignment of, of a fractional interest in the royalties. Short of a permanent assignment of that, you can still get them to, through, through many mineral management programs, you can get them to assign a fractional interest in their royalty income stream to be administered as part of the, the mineral management process as well. Let me, let me touch on something here. So if I'm you, and we all live on budgets and we all have to plan and we all have at some point in time a meeting where we go over the next year's budget, You'll notice, obviously, that royalty stream income is dependent upon a host of market factors and dependent upon a, a, uh, an area being uh, aggressive. Let's go back to Bob Burnett's observation. He would rather have an assignment of royalty rights by a royalty income by deed because it carries no uh, liability or very little, if any, at all liability, but it does provide a, a deed interest. That means it's transferable. One of the issues with a royalty interest through the contract alone is that the lease expires, or if, if it no longer exists, then your right to income expires. And likewise, if you have a royalty right by deed, you therefore have the ability to transfer it by deed to a third party, because that's what we are seeing in down markets like this. People who have uh, oil and gas rights by deed, be they ownership outright or royalty rights, 
now have the ability to transfer those and those generally speaking get favorable income tax treatment the one thing we haven't talked about is that for landowners royalty income is ordinary income the sale of, a, of a, an oil and gas right all other things being equal is a capital gain and most likely a long-term capital gain with much more favorable tax consequences so all this plays into the value of the asset and and your options with that asset just to recap, and we heard earlier about the difference between gifts of what I'll call OGM rights, gifts of real property interest versus the right to receive income, the assignment of the royalties. Oil, gas, and mineral rights are real property rights. You may receive some or all. You may or may not get rights on the surface. They can be severed. I don't know how many folks here uh, happened to catch the, the hearings last week uh, on these. I don't know, one person in the room watched my YouTube channel. Um, there's, there's still hearings that, are, that have to do with the severed oil, gas, and mineral interests underlying the Allegheny National Forest. Why? Because those are privately owned. You can, you may get a gift of interests that underlie property that, that the donor has had no interest in for decades. Okay, these are separate <coughs> property rights that can be separately deeded and assigned. When you're offered one of those real property rights, you have one of two choices. You go to the next slide, Steve. You can either you can either sell or keep it, okay? Um, we'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. Is it a gift of oil, gas, and mineral rights, or is it? I mean, that's, that's one of the questions that, that, that Steve uh, asked earlier. Is it a gift or sale of an exchange of, of an interest in the gas lease, only conveying the rights in the lease, or does it convey the actual uh, property rights? And the difference is, are you, are you, you know, ultimately, the donor may say one thing and mean the other. You're not going to know until you see draft documents, right? Is it, going to, is it going to be a deed or is it going to be an assignment? It's going to be a big issue because there's the other half of the equation. The producer will need a singular entity or a singular voice with which to deal to make decisions. And if they don't know who to send royalty checks to or they don't know the proper party to send royalty checks to, it's a pretty big issue. And again, I go back to the executive rights. This is a big sticking point. Normally you see it now where couples who are divorcing decide for one reason or another to share the oil and gas rights because they foresee large production and large dollars down the line, but they forget they can't agree on the time of day, but five years from now they're going to agree on what lease they're going to sign, what terms and conditions there are going to be, what the royal, what the percentage will be, what, what day of the week it is. So you, you go back to the fundamental question. And when you get these gifts, set up a meeting with your, your tax and legal advisors because there, this really needs to be implemented from the onset. If it's a gift of real property, is it a gift in total? If it's a gift of royalty only, is it a deed gift or is it a contractual gift? And understand the rights and responsibilities that goes with those. And, and then finally, uh, if it's a gift from a family limited partnership or a limited liability company, because of tax laws in Pennsylvania, family limited partnerships are more favorable, a lot of the times you will see that the oil and gas rights are held by a family limited partnership. Get a copy of the partnership agreement because that's going to tell you if there are any skeletons in the closet. And engage the, the professionals of the, you know, the donor's going to have somebody hopefully working with them, an attorney, an accountant. Make sure you're engaged with those folks early on and you can maybe get some more definitive answers as to whether or not there's an intent to give it a gift of a royalty income stream or a real property right. I mentioned earlier, if, you, if you're given a gift of real property rights, you have two choices, keep or sell. In many cases, uh, many charities had actually exercised a third option, which was to say no thank you. Um, they turned down very valuable uh, gifts of both uh, real property and the right to receive future royalty income streams. Why? Because they had no gift acceptance policy. They didn't understand it. That's why we're here, so that folks can develop those policies and, and learn how to accept those gifts. Once you've done that, you have two choices. You can hold on to the rights or you can sell them. And there's a, there's a big push. I guarantee you, if you are deeded oil, gas, and mineral interests in Pennsylvania, or if you have been in the last five years, or if you are in the next five years, you will receive a communication from a brokerage somewhere offering to purchase those rights. They're all over the place. And sometimes they're 
good deals and sometimes they're not. There's no hard and fast rule, should you always, should you never. For most individuals, that choice is a, is a personal choice. For most nonprofits, it should be a longer term view. You know, you're in perpetual existence. Your mission is going to survive for decades. You can afford, in many cases, to take a longer term view and maximize the value of that gift over time. Some folks, you know, maybe you're, you're uh, you know, the financial advice that you've received is, uh, well, we manage money. So convert it to money and we'll manage that. That may or may not be the best long term solution. So you need to do some math. You need to look at, well, you know, what's the likelihood of production? Is that something that we need uh, for, our, for our capital campaign? Or is that something that we can put on the shelf and benefit from over the course of history? You also have to watch, uh, you know, valuation of those components. Um, if you keep the rights, you have to manage them. That's part of what mineral management is. But, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a time when you have to understand the value of, of what they're worth and what they may produce in the future. And that's the, the concept of valuation. And that's the number one question I get asked. If somebody gives you $100,000, that's easy. A dollar sign, a one, five zeros, a decimal point, two more zeros. But if you got 211 acres in Warren County, what's it worth? And Tom Toronto, my colleague, raise your hand, Tom. If, mother, if necessity is the mother of invention, then, then uh, opportunity is the father of invention. Because several years ago, we had, I think it was discussed earlier, three brothers who lived all out of state, they owned because their father had passed 211 acres in Warren County, Pennsylvania. And we had, the, and Tom comes to me and says, what are the oil and gas rights worth? What are they worth? Well, the answer is what somebody else is willing to pay for them. But we looked at the, uh, at the uh, real estate appraisal, and the real estate appraisal specifically excluded oil and gas. Now, how do you know what it's worth? If it were a diamond, it would be easy. You would go get it appraised. If it's oil and gas, it's a little different. The market fluctuates. So valuation, knowing what you have and what it's worth, and whether you have the ability to sell it is critical. And, and you see my three friends on the right. Those are the people to not consult when you want to know what something is worth. You know, uh, my selfish standpoint here is we created the market price uh, report. What's it worth now? What's it worth in 2016? It's probably worth less than it was in 2012. Certainly, if you're just across the river in a high, or the line in a high, and you were about part of the BP 70,000 acre deal, it was worth a lot of money then. It's not worth so much money now. So another component to, to mineral management is, okay, we have this asset, but what's it really worth? And the answer is that it fluctuates. And what it's worth is going to change, and what you do with it will change based upon what it's worth. If it's a producing property, it's your cash cow. If it's a non-producing property, it's an expense in some form or fashion. You have to manage it, you have to pay professionals to do it. How do you best maximize the dollar value from this? So do not follow the trio on the right when you're trying to figure out what it's worth. I mentioned most of these, we'll go through these real quickly. What is mineral management, evaluation lease offers, referral to professionals? Uh, in, you know, there, there's a, there's a, there are different schools of thought uh, in western states versus Pennsylvania about whether or not the negotiation of an oil and gas lease is, is legal work. I think it's been pretty clearly established in Pennsylvania that lawyers are charged with negotiating oil and gas leases for those uh, third parties with whom they have no other relationship. Uh, the exception would be in a, in a bank with trust powers, maybe you could negotiate a, a lease on behalf of a trust uh, where they're serving as trustee. But generally, you know, your donor's going to have a separate attorney for, for, for those purposes. You, if you own those rights, are going to need a separate attorney if you have that executive right and are faced with those issues. Uh, but part of the process is, part of the mineral management process is coordinating that, reviewing proposed leases and the other documents that generate <coughs> the dollars, what are those documents, division orders, declarations of pooling and unitization, uh, specific documents. Most of them appear in public record, but they can be fluid and they can change. Changes in those documents are, that are recorded can change the right to receive uh, royalty payment. Verification of the, the decimal interest, in other words, you know, how the, the core value, um, how, how these rights are compensated, how you're paid. Uh, not just, uh, you know, you don't just get 5% of whatever somebody else got, you know, you're, you have a, there's a long, uh, there's a long formula that requires a lot of inputs and, we, and, and one of the components of mineral management is to track that. Also price production, distribution, 
know, where's the gas going for how much, how much was reported in terms of production of the Commonwealth, how much was reported on the check stub to you as the owner of those rights, distribution of the net proceeds, and, and, and reporting. You know, the problem is, this isn't like selling timber. You can't go out and take the tape measure and measure the stump and say, oh, well, I can tell that was a maple tree and it was a 16-inch diameter tree and I can go back and figure out what that, I mean, you cannot just treat this like free money checks in the mail either. Uh, it is an asset, it's a unique asset. The comptroller of the currency for the U.S. Treasury views it as a, uh, a high-risk asset from the standpoint of administration and trust or in a fiduciary capacity and it requires a certain amount of uh, expertise in the management of that and that's the sort of thing that charities who own those types of rights can contract away that obligation or that that responsibility it's one thing to make money it's another to keep it and the benefit of, of where I work again a shameless plug I, I work for a, a full-service financial services company I have CPAs I have tax consultants I have wealth advisors I have an advisory firm I have an energy component inside my business. My business was created for, for just this opportunity. But what it really highlights is, is this is a tire, an entirely different game. And you have to learn the rules of the game. And you have to understand the asset. So we, we had a man from uh, DEP up here earlier. Those are all publicly accessible websites that you have. You can track the reporting. If you have audit rights, that's going to be in a lease. Exercise those audit rights if the money makes sense. But what you can't do is you can't not try. And there's a certain level of self-education that has to occur. And it's fairly easy. It's, it's not one, two, three, four, five. But I have found that DEP is a great resource. It's ODNR in Ohio is a, is a splendid resource. The United States Energy Information is a splendid resource. And if you are a, a, an owner of royalty interest, join NARO, National Association of Royalty Owners. Great valuable, uh, valuable resource for you. And then manage the money well. NARO also will have periodic educational seminars and, and how to do this, how to, how to help learn how to do that. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we won't name any names, we'll protect the guilty. Uh, but some, many of you in the room have heard me give this example. It's a real life example. Uh, Western Pennsylvania school gets a gift and it was rather sizable. It was a, it was, um, a gift that was in a series of sizable gifts. It was a sizable gift in and of itself. And it was a gift of severed oil, gas, and mineral rights under a small portion of the donor's property. The donor had 100, or roughly 1,000 acres. This was a gift of 150 acres worth of oil, gas, and mineral interests in an area where there was current Marcellus drilling activity and production. In fact, they were receiving royalties from, from this piece. And so the donor, who had no prior connection, wasn't even a college graduate to this university, just like the school and what it did for the town, wanted to do something nice, gave a series of gifts of, of timber, gave a gift of some surface interest, and then gave a gift of several oil, gas, and mineral interest. And what did the, what did the school do? The school consulted its financial advisor. Financial advisor said, oh, we don't do that. You should sell that. We manage money. So the school sold it. And how will I say this politely? Alienated the donor to the point where the, that was the very last gift that they got from that donor. Why? Because the donor's intention was to benefit that charity for decades, not to sell it at a deep discount for pennies on the dollar to the first broker that they could find. And so there was a, there was a tough lesson learned there. Um, uh, another example you will encounter, and I encounter this all the time, donors that you know, they love you. They want to give you money, but they don't trust you. They don't trust you with this very unique asset. Um, many of us in the room, and I'm looking for, for Tom and others, uh, if you deal with people that deal with a lot of timber, the more trees they own, the more they like them, and the more important and special they are, same with this. This is a very unique, special asset. We work with a lot of donors who will set up trusts for the benefit of the charity because they're not interested in conveying title to this asset because, frankly, they're afraid you don't know what to do with it. They're afraid you're going to sell it. You're going to afraid, they're afraid you're not going to manage it properly, not going to appreciate its value. And so the good news, if, if you're dealing with you know, a bank with Pennsylvania trust powers, 
uh, you know, there are some things that you can do to still realize the benefit of a gift. You can be the beneficiary of a trust where that property is held in trust, administered in trust, and you can be the beneficiary and have no liability and really no accounting and no responsibility other than cashing checks. Um, that may or may not be the highest and best gift that you can receive. The good news is it's an option in, in case uh, you run into those donors. I think that wraps up, but I, we skipped something that I, I think is worth going over, and that is a picture's worth a thousand words. Anybody ever been so poor that they put their hands between the cushions of their sofa to find nickels and dimes? My days in college, 2008, uh, those days. Uh, I would do, if, if I had a summer intern and no, and no other task for him or her, I would do an asset scrub of all my real estate interests on uh, anything that had been donated to my organization from time immemorial. Because I suspect that if you have significant land interests, you also have oil and gas and mineral right ownership interests, or maybe even royalty interests that you didn't know existed. And uh, while you may have missed the first wave, eventually in our society, this, this energy infatuated society, those will become valuable assets. And uh, hence the term black gold for oil and the reference to Henry Hub. Everything has a dollar sign and everything revolves around the dollar in the energy industry. Those are my, my, my parting words and I thank you for your time and attention. But have any questions? Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Many times, the first time that they have an inkling, uh, if it's outside of a traditional oil and gas producing region in Pennsylvania, the first time that they have any clue is when the landman knocks on their door. The landman does the advance work for the company. The landman will come, go to the courthouse, find out who owns what, knock on the door, literally come and visit them and, and have a conversation. The earlier the landman gets a signature on a lease document, usually the better the deal for the oil and gas company, not necessarily for the landowner. Um, and not to paint too, you know, too, with too broad of a brush, but there's, a, there's an entire business Whose, whose aim it is, These, the, the concept of the landman going out and, and getting this, the lease assigned in the first place, specifically designed uh, to, to get those signatures before there's been a whole lot of education. That's not probably as true now as it used to be. One of the reasons that our division at, at Northwest was formed was to try to help provide some of that education. That's what the mission of the Marcellus Outreach Program was through Penn State Cooperative Extension. Uh, how, you know, the, the flip, flip of that, and this is what you were saying, Steve, you know, a lot of people say, well, how do I know if I own the oil gas mineral rights? And you don't. You know, you, we did the same thing. We, we talked to our trust department. Hey, do we have oil gas and mineral rights? Oh, no. We don't, you know, we, we don't have those. It's going back a few years. You go and do you own any, you know, do you hold any property in trust, any real estate? Oh, yeah, we have lots of real estate held in trust. Well, you know, then you have likely have oil, gas, and mineral rights, and we're not alone. Other trust departments, others, just like the appraisal that you were talking about, you have to get an oil, gas, and mineral appraisal to value that subsurface right because your standard appraisal that you have done at the bank when you bought your home excludes subsurface rights. You know, the title search that you had done when you got your property. If you had one done, if you're given a gift, maybe you didn't have one done at all, you just took a gift and said thank you. But even if you bought property, your title search that you had done didn't include a search of the subsurface rights. Nobody's going back, you know, you, you, your attorney or your settlement company went back 30 years, maybe 60 years in some rural counties, and they only did a, a, a search of the surface. There are separate chains that go back 150 years. You have to go back to August 1859 on any oil, gas, mineral search in Pennsylvania to know whether or not there was a prior reservation exception severance of those oil gas and mineral rights. Nobody wants to spend thousands of dollars on a separate title search to find out if maybe they own those rights. When what happens when, when you sign a lease or your donor signs a lease, that's when the you know the folks will come and knock on your door and say we've identified you in our review of the, the records of the courthouse you own subsurface rights. 
I, I will tell you, if you think you might and, and there's an issue or there's some outstanding rights that may be worth spending some money to, to confirm it, but typically that's the first time. Uh, and, and rights will have a value today that they won't have tomorrow. Right, Steve? I mean... Which brings up the other point. If, if you or grandma or grandpa or your aunt or uncle are getting postcards from somewhere in Oklahoma, that's a good sign that you have something that somebody else wants to buy. And, and the, the postcards, especially uh, in this neck of the woods and, and across the, uh, the state line in Ohio, where you have BP that abandoned its lease, you now have a bunch of 70, 80-year-old people who thought they were going to get royalty checks. Instead, they're getting a postcard two or three times a week offering to buy their, uh, their mineral rights or oil and gas rights. That's significantly deeply discounted. Right. Yeah. Any other questions, folks? Okay, well, you have great times ahead of you, uh, but this is a great time to, uh, to lay the foundation and, and plant the seeds and uh, make your organizations more financially astute for decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you.